um it's a wonderful pleasure and honor to um to now turn it over to professor jim ferrell stanford university to tell us about his path to systems biology aka living histories thank you sri thank you to all the living histories people for the invitation to come and do this um for those of you who don't know me um I'm a biologist, and my research has uh, benefited a lot, has been influenced a lot um, by physics. And so what I'm going to try to do is give you some some of my biography and show how I ended up being a biologist who, who uh, does a little bit of physics, too. I was born in 1955. Um, my neither of my grandparents, neither of my grandfathers graduated from high school. My um, parents were the first in their families to go to college and graduate from college. Um, my sister and I are both professors at universities now. Um, the rest of my father's family were steel workers at U.S. Steel. Um, my father got a middle management position at U.S. Steel, and um, so I was born in an industrial city, Gary, Indiana, and um, moved from there to Pittsburgh, then to Chicago, and then back to Pittsburgh, where I did most of my growing up. I was one of these kids who knew, like, right from the start that I wanted to be a scientist. I really liked science. I liked all kinds of science, and so I found this picture on the web of some very benign looking young scientists um, peering at the little uh, propulsion boat in their tubs. Um, my friends and I tended to make bombs in the backyard. Um, and I've since I've been a, a grown up, I've, I've discovered that really quite a number of famous chemists um, throughout the United States made bombs in their backyard when they were kids. So anyway, that's how I started out. By junior high and high school, um, I started doing science fairs. And um, so that was an introduction to independent research. These days at science fairs, I think the, the winners always um, are you know, doing research at some, in some university lab where they're, they're doing some like, kind of legitimate science. Back, back in my day though, these were made up projects and they were sometimes pretty stupid. Um, because we were little kids making up science fair projects. Um, like I did one project where I looked to see if my mice, whose names were Blackie and Brownie, um, would get smarter if I gave them supplemental oxygen. And um, <laughs> as far as I could tell, they <laughs> they didn't. Um, but some of the experiments were pretty good. The, the one on the right there, um, I... I programmed a computer to um, to play tic-tac-toe, but instead of like giving the computer the rules, I um, um, I made it so that the, the computer would play randomly if it had never seen the situation before, and then if it was a mistake, it would remember its mistake. So this, um, this machine learning kind of stuff seems to have taken off since then. I went to public schools. Um, I went to a public high school that was really big and was filled with smart people. And that was important to me, um, that I had this peer group of people who were really, you know, just quite brilliant. Here's, here's seven of us. Um, four out of the seven in this picture um, went on to become professors at universities. Um, I'm the second from the, the left in the in the back. Um, those of you who are fluent in semaphore can figure out what rude um, four and then three letter phrase uh, we're um, spelling out here. Um, one thing though bad about a big high school was um, it was a bit dehumanizing. So when it came time to go away to college, I decided to go to a small college, even though um, it, uh, I, I knew I wanted to do science. So I went to Williams College and took lots and lots of science classes and tried to keep my options open about what to eventually major in. Um, I did some uh, physics research. I did an, an honors thesis with this guy, David Park, 
who was a really brilliant physicist on um, equations of motion and the integrals of motion in a nonlinear dynamical system. And that intro introduced me to um, Pratt Carve and nonlinear dynamics and a lot of stuff that I figured I'd never need to to know again in my life. It was it, it, it was really inspiring. But inspiring though it may be, it seemed to me like biologists got to tackle the best problems in science. And um, I still think this is true. I, this was a, this was my perception when I was a college student. And my problem was I didn't actually take much by I took chemistry, I took physics, I took math. I actually ended up majoring in all three. Um, but I only took one biology class. So the question was, if I had decided I wanted to be a biologist now, how was I going to get like a biology PhD program to, to accept me? And um, I think probably the, the right advice would have been to go and work in a biology lab for a while um, and learn if biology was really right for me. But that that didn't even occur to me and nobody mentioned that as a possibility to me. Instead, um, I knew that medical schools accepted people who had, had backgrounds in all sorts of different things. So I decided I'd go to medical school and learn biology that way and came out to Stanford where I, where I am now. And right off the start, I um, did research. Um, my first research mentor at Stanford was um, Gilda Lowe, who was an adjunct associate professor of genetics, although she wasn't a geneticist. She was a quantum biologist, a quantum chemist um, at a time when quantum chemistry was in its infancy. Her goal was to make use of these big computations um, to try to derive some sort of understanding of something that was important for biology like in the activation of chemical carcinogens, why the oxidases, why the P450 enzymes would attack this carbon and not attack that carbon. Or with opioids, why some opioids were acting as agonists and some were acting as antagonists. That's what we did. Um, I published a few papers with Gilda and really enjoyed working with her. I thought she was brilliant and it was fun work. Um, but after a year or two, I realized that really what we needed to do was once we had done all these calculations, we needed to test some sort of a prediction. And um, I set, a, set out trying to find a collaborator to work with us on this. And um, I couldn't find one. Um, I, t I must have talked to a couple of dozen people at Stanford and nobody wanted to, to work with us. Gilda had this friend at UC Santa Barbara, who was a famous biophysical chemist that wanted to collaborate with us, but I didn't want to go to Santa Barbara. So I ended up after two years switching to a different lab on a different project. Um, this was in the chemistry department at Stanford. Um, a woman named Ray Hustos, who was interested in using the simplicity of red blood cells to allow you to get some sort of a quantitative understanding of some biological phenomenon. And what I worked on was this shape change. Red cells are normally discoid, and that discoid shape is important for their flow properties. Um, but if they ran out of ATP, they'd change shape in this really bizarre way that end up looking like a grain of pollen. And tried to, wanted to understand how the cell could get instructed to change in shape from a biconcave disc to one of these spiculate spheres in the course of a couple of hours. Made a good start in that lab, got a paper pretty quickly with by helping a senior graduate student, Mark Nelson, with his work, and then hit the wall. I was doing some experiments for what was gonna be my thesis project. And the first four times I did the experiments, they gave the hoped for result. And um, then the fifth through the 20th time, they didn't. Um, and I was um, I was left without a good working hypothesis for explaining that shape change that I was talking with you about. And Ray really didn't have any good ideas either. And at the same time, I got um, 
rejected by the medical scientist training program here at Stanford, which funds MD PhDs. And that was a big sort of professional blow. And my then girlfriend dumped me. So I was I was miserable. I was pretty depressed at that point. And um, I decided rather than taking um, um, things head on, I would um, distract myself with something that might bring fun back into my life. I auditioned for and started playing in the pit band for a student production of the musical Hair. And I met some really nice people um, in that production. Started a band with some of them. And the band did really well. So I, I spent really the next kind of four years of my PhD work mostly kind of playing in a band and trying to get my experiments to work in, in my free time. Um, I, I'm still good friends with, with the, the people that you see on, on stage here. I, I still see them all the time. I, the keyboard player there, Jay Gitterman, and I went out to, for coffee on Saturday. Um, and I met this young woman, um, young art historian who um, ended up being pretty significant to me. Um, and then finally the band broke up and I finally guessed a hypothesis that ended up being correct. I got my papers, went back to medical school. And back in medical school, I did the things that um, a senior medical student does. I delivered babies, I delivered 30 babies. I did operations um, with the good medical students. They, they let you, you know, if you do well enough on your surgery rotation, Toward the end, maybe they'll let you do an appendectomy. Um, and I did I did one. I did all the cutting and all the sewing, and the patient lived several hours. No, he was <laughs> he was fine. Um, and then the question was: I I I liked this medical practice stuff. I what I especially liked about it was that um sort of every day you were doing something good for somebody. And I wondered whether I could balance some patient care with some research. And I decided that I, I could not. I just wasn't good enough at multitasking. And would do a postdoc, learn how to be a, an independent research scientist. Went up to um, Berkeley, joined the lab of Steve Martin, who was working on tyrosine-specific protein phosphorylation, a subject near and dear to Flora's heart. Um, and I liked the research. I did a, um, I started on a project that was to do structure function studies of the EGF receptor to understand how the receptor changed from being a normal mediator of cell growth to an oncogenic mediator of cell growth after it was mutated. Got scooped on that. But I had a backup project, started to work on that, and got married to Britta, the woman that I showed you earlier. Yay. Um, then late in my time as a postdoc, Andrew Murray came to give a talk. Um, Andrew was still a, a postdoc himself at, at UCSF at the time. It was such an inspirational talk. He used um, frog egg extracts to test some hypotheses about how the cell cycle worked. And these extracts, you know, they were an in vitro system, but they would do the cell cycle and you could manipulate them. You could put things in them, take things out of them. And it just seemed so powerful that I decided that I wanted to learn how to, to work on frog eggs. And went and found collaborators who were good at doing frog extract stuff at Berkeley, John Gerhardt and his technician, Mike Wu. And this time the collaboration worked out fine. They were happy to work with um this kind of young postdoc and really helped me out. Um, got some papers written, got a job, University of Wisconsin. That didn't stick. And I came back to Stanford, got a baby. There was my first one. We got two. And then started out as an assistant professor in the Department of Pharmacology here at Stanford with a very logical research plan on a hot topic, MAP kinase biochemistry and cell biology. Um, one of the hottest things that was happening then. My um, research plan was so logical, bulletproof, that it 
I got the first R01 that I wrote for and and I set out trying to do the work and you know, AIM 1 got scooped and then AIM 2 got scooped and AIM 3 got scooped, AIM 4 got scooped. They not only got scooped, each of these things got scooped by five other labs within a month of each other. Um, so I learned from this that doing the logical next step forward wasn't always prudent because you might not be quite as fast as the next person. We did get some progress made on the less simple um, task of looking downstream of map kinase, finding what its functions and targets are. Um, but really, the thing that um, ended up being a lasting contribution, I, I think, um, came from just the fact that we knew enough about the map kinase cascade that we knew its structure. It was three kinases in a row. We also knew that it was involved in all sorts of biology. It was involved in cell cycle arrest in yeast and in cell cycle progression in mammalian cells and in transdifferentiation in PC12 cells in culture and in real differentiation in lots of cells in embryogenesis. So the biology wasn't well conserved, but the structure was. And so that raised the question of What's special about the structure? What could it perform that something simpler might not be able to perform? And one way to address that would be to do this stuff that I did when I was an undergraduate in physics and write out some ordinary differential equations, rate equations, and play around with the parameters and see what this kind of a system did versus that kind of a system. So I went back to my high school friend, Brad Osgood, who's on the faculty here at Stanford and asked, he's a mathematician. I asked him how to do this. And he said, buy Mathematica. And I bought it and I had results within an hour, I'd say. Of, and um, that kind of thing um, has been what we've done now for the last um, 20 years. Um, uh, come up with some something that seems like a good concept maybe try to flesh out the concept by doing either theory um, or numerical simulations, and then do the experiments, the strategic experiments that might falsify the theory or give us some evidence to back up the theory. And it's worked out well. And I think it's worked out well in part because when we started doing this, people were a little bit sick of doing qualitative biology, which was really, the main way to do science when I was training, um, clone a gene, see what the function of the gene was, then see what was upstream of it, see what was upstream from that, and so on. Um, and in part, it went okay because um, we really did do the experiments. Um, theoretical biologists tended to get ignored, but since we didn't have to convince somebody else to do the experiments for us, we could maybe drive things a little bit further. Um, so that's that. Thank you for listening and um, buy the book if, you're, um, if you've got some money in your pocket. Wow, Jim, uh, thank you so much. What an interesting and rich living history. Um, let me start on behalf of the audience with a um, burning question. Um, were <laughs> all the people you knew of who became scientists after blowing up things in their backyard uh, all raised in the Midwest? Were they all raised in the Midwest? I yeah. don't know. I've met people at conferences who started like rhapsodizing in, <laughs> in the bus on the way to the marina about the time they set their couch on fire with liquid oxygen there you know, I, I i'm not sure that it was all a midwestern thing i see okay uh well well on to a more uh less frivolous question um you did not highlight the systems aspect of the systems biology um of the systems biology that you work on as much in this trajectory so would you walk us through what drew you to the systems aspect of studying systems biology? 
Um, I could say it was, you know, some appreciation of the fact that that more is different, or you know, that 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 um, interesting behaviors could emerge at the level of systems that weren't present, weren't weren't inherent in the proteins. Or I could I could tell you that I I knew Linus Pauling's famous quote that life is is not a molecule; it's an in, it's an interaction between molecules. Um, but that wasn't it. It was really just the fact that in going one by one up the map kinase cascade, we finally knew, you know, three things. And that almost immediately um, uh, provoked the question of, you know, what, what are those three things doing? And what could those three things be doing that would be, you know, interesting and distinctive? And that includes things the three things can do that one thing can't. Cool. So that's uh, the that's the the entree to systems. Awesome. Um, let me wrap with a final question, which is about the slide that most people have in the living history stock, which you did not. Um, which is the advice that they give other people. Um, perhaps you're averse to giving advice, but I wanted to give you a chance to um share any do this don't do that kind of items you have for early career people well yeah i don't know work on something you really like because it's hard work um and um do this stuff if it's your calling Wow. Okay. On that super high note, thank you so much. On I'm closing the closing the recording and thanking you on behalf of the audience.